The Brave Archer is adapted from the story The Eagle Shooting Heroes, which appeared in serialized form in a Hong Kong newspaper in the 1950s by the author Jin Yong. On first sight, The Brave Archer is an incredibly convoluted story. There's a huge range of characters, and, and particularly if you just watch the first one by itself, there are countless subplots that are unresolved when the final credits roll. The basic story is essentially that there are two babies who are, who are sworn to become blood brothers by their parents, but are supposed to have a duel to see who's the best martial artist when they reach their age of 18. And that's the sort of the preamble in The Brave Archer, and then it abandons that to all intents and purposes and becomes about the hero's attempt to win the hand of the girl of his dreams. So you, you think what happened to the story about the two babies growing up to have a duel that's been abandoned, well that's for the two sequels that came later. I think the reason that Chang was willing to let his film sort of end with all these unresolved plots was partly that he would be relying on the fact that this wasn't the first time it had, this story had been told on screen and it had certainly been a very popular novel. So I think he thought his audience would kind of tag along for the ride. It's a bit like I guess Harry Potter or something, or, 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 the, or the Ralph Bakshi Lord of the Rings of the 1970s. You could, you could hope that you were going to get to make the sequel, but otherwise you knew the audience would bear with you if you didn't tell the whole story. Uh, Ching, you can do some practicing by yourself. Me? Uh, um, uh... No, come on. You're not a child. You go on, and we'll soon join you. Fu Sheng at this time would have been in his early 20s, around 22, 23, playing a character who was meant to be about 18. Uh, his character, uh, Kao Tsing, is not particularly bright, and, and that's deliberate. Uh, the sort of world that these characters inhabit, uh, well, there's two sides to this. There's the Wu Lin, which is the world of the martial arts, but then there's the Jiang Hu, which is the world of the vagrants. Uh, that's a slightly strong term in English, but really it refers to these characters of sort of no fixed abode and of dubious means of income, who travel the world getting into misadventures. And that's where we see the, the first group of teachers that take on Cow's martial arts training. Uh, they're called, depending on what the subtitles are translated as, either the Weird Seven or the Seven Eccentrics of Jiang Nan. Uh, but one of the interesting things about The Brave Archer is that it breaks with the, the tradition, of very well established in many Kung Fu movies, of the relationship between the pupil and the single master. Uh, instead, the hero in this film has a series of masters, each of whom imparts to him an, another aspect of his martial arts training. So that he sort of collects all these different and eclectic martial arts styles the further the film goes along. And this not only is, is interesting in this film, but it has a, is a clear influence on the Kung Fu comics that come out in Hong Kong all the time, particularly uh, Ma Wing-shing's long-running The Blood Sword Saga, in which the, the central character has a series of sifus who each expand and improve his martial arts knowledge. So that, ha that happens here, and that's why, again, it, it, it all adds to how confusing the plot can be, because he's got one sifu, and then he's got another, and then another, and he's just constantly building on his martial arts knowledge. But the fact that, they, going back to the point that the fact that the hero is not very bright, and in the final scene, when he has to compete in reciting verses, he can't read. This goes back to him being part of this world of the Chang Hu, these wandering people who get into misadventures, a sort of a slightly romantic notion of vagabonds, I suppose. Good for you. You're really strong now. And so in future, your Kung Fu will improve. Chang made The Brave Archer after a, a period when he'd been working in Taiwan for roughly two years, mainly because Shaw Brothers, the production studio, had money they couldn't move out of Taiwan. Uh, so Chang went over there to sort of put it to good use in making films there for them. So when he came back to Hong Kong, he, his first film was The Brave Archer, which was, looking at it, you know, it's got all the classic Shaw Brothers impressive sets, it's got uh, spectacular costumes, not all the special effects are going to stand up to blockbuster criteria, particularly the snake is, <laughs> is clearly plastic, but, uh, but it was a big hit, you know, hence the fact that he was able to make the two sequels to it. And Fu Sheng was a big star at this point. It was really Heroes 2 in 1974 that put Fu Sheng on the map, but his, he was very much in the ascendancy at this point. The following year, Chang and Fu Sheng would reunite on, on a completely different film, The Chinatown Kid, 
which is a contemporary film that mainly takes place in San Francisco and involves the triads and gang wars in San Francisco. Come on. One of the predominant uh, trends in Kung Fu cinema in the late 1970s is the rise of the Kung Fu comedy, which effectively eclipsed Chang's previous mode of filmmaking, the Yang Gang staunch masculinity school of filmmaking. Now, Chang inevitably likes to take credit for the sort of rise of the Kung Fu comedy, and he talks about his 1970, 1970s films with Fu Sheng as introducing what's called the Siu Zi, uh, character, which is a, roughly, it's a Mandarin phrase that doesn't really translate into Cantonese, in English it roughly means kid or brat. And it's these very youthful heroes that are mischievous, effectively. They're young, they're good looking, they're athletic, but they're slightly troublemakers. Uh, so Fu Sheng would embody this in his portrayal of Feng Sayuk in the various Shaolin films for Chang Chair, and we see it very clearly in his character in The Brave Archer. He's not terribly bright, he gets into trouble, but he's got a good heart and he's good at Kung Fu, or at least he's a good learner when he's got the right teachers, and he certainly has a procession of those. So, it, it, and you can see Chang attempting comedy in this film. I don't think comedy was ever his strongest suit. He was much better at tragedy and drama. Lao Ga Leung would, would, had a stronger comic touch, as we see in The Spiritual Boxer and then later My Young Auntie. Chang was always best at bloodshed uh, and, and, and heroics, heroic gestures rather than gags, but we see him trying to do comedy here. A lot, of, a lot of the comedy really in The Brave Archer comes from the female lead, Tian Yu, who plays, who plays Huang Yung, the, uh, who starts out in that classic Kung Fu trope of a, being a beautiful young woman dressed as a man, and everyone is fooled and thinks it's a, it's a man, which nobody watching the film is ever fooled. But Tian Yu ha has a lot of charisma in this role. I think Fu Sheng is, hampered to some extent by the fact that his character is meant to be a bit of a dunce. Whereas Tian Yu is lively, she's funny, she's engaging, and she's certainly the more charismatic performer of the two on this occasion. I think she, she happily carries the comedy that Fu Sheng can't quite get off the ground. I was stupid, thinking you were a boy. I mean, it's obvious you're a girl. We can only speculate what could have happened with Fu Sheng's career had he not died in a car accident. Um, he w I think he would have faced the same challenges that most of the Shaw Brothers stars had to confront in the 1980s of the studio abandoning film production for television and Kung Fu cinema very decisively going out of fashion to be replaced by um, contemporary action films. Though Fu had proved that he could do contemporary action in The Chinatown Kid, so I think he might have fared better than others who were sort of relegated to supporting roles or working as action choreographers for directors making triad movies. I'm going to get revenge. I hope to see you later. Goodbye. I think perhaps one of the reasons that Shaw Brothers never produced a, a sort of standout star on, on the, to the same level as Bruce Lee or Jackie Chan or any of the guys that came later it might have been due to the fact that the studio liked to keep such strict control over their actors. Uh, you know, Bruce Lee was offered a Shaw Brothers contract and turned it down because it was too restrictive and he got much greater freedom to do what he wanted with Golden Harvest and Raymond Chow. Also, I think there is an issue of quality control at Shaw Brothers. They were pumping out movies at a very fast rate. Actors might be going from one set to another you know, to, to keep up with production schedules. I don't think perhaps there was time for them to sort of develop their personas. But, but some of it, I think, is also the fact that those movies didn't quite reach the West and to the same extent that Golden Harvest films did. Uh, they, they were very much catering for an Asian audience and a Chinese audience. So perhaps that curtailed the success of them beyond, beyond that market. I think what makes Brave Archer interesting really is, is that it's Chang's return to working in Shaw Brothers in Hong Kong. 
So it's got it's got the scale of one of their films from that time. It's the costumes are beautiful. There's all the spectacular sets. He's not working with Tong Kai and Lao Galing as action choreographers at this point because uh, at this time Lao Galing is off pursuing his own directing career. But it still features all kinds of spectacular martial arts, very much reflecting the influence of the novel from which it's taken. This is uh, clearly the sort of Wu Xiaopian school of thought in which the martial artists possess slightly fantastic abilities. We're not looking at sort of the kind of practical hand-to-hand -hand combat that Bruce Lee was staging in his films, or, or the sort of free-form acrobatics of Jackie Chan and Samuel Hung. This is the, the martial artist as a sort of semi-superheroic figure, a mythical figure, learning the, you know, the 18 dragon palms, as, as the hero does in this film. So it, it's a precursor, certainly, to what Choi Hark and Ching Su Tung would do in their careers in the 80s, That's that magical school of martial arts in which you learn all these mystical techniques that give you beyond superhuman abilities. The Brave Archer isn't the last adaptation of Chin Yong's Eagle Shooting Hero story. Uh, it would be returned to in the 1990s uh, by two different directors, Jeff Lau's Eagle Shooting Heroes, which is very loosely based on the same material, and then Wong Kar Wai's Ashes of Time, which takes a difficult story and makes it even more impenetrable. Yes. Wong Kar Wai's Ashes of Time effectively takes the supporting characters from this story and makes them the center of, of, of the film, whilst the sort of main plot unfolds in, in some fashion in the background. Um, make of that what you can, is what I would suggest. We won't be parted. Right. Until we die. The, the romantic side of, of Brave Archer, I think, is pretty much from the novel. That reflects Jing Yong's approach to the martial arts novel that came out in the 1950s. Um, in which his heroes did fall in love. It's, it's a distinct contrast to the films that Chang wrote from his own stories, or, or from Shaolin myths, where the women are either absent or, or a nuisance. Um, and, and of course the final shot of this movie is the, the Fu Sheng and Tian Yu's characters coming together to join hands. And kind of what's interesting about that is the way that it's staged, because it's shot on a sound stage against this sort of empty space which is how Lao Ga Leng used to shoot the opening title sequences for all his films in which people would do kung fu in an empty lot. So it's sort of swapping the sort of nihilistic kung fu for a little romance, which is very unusual for Chang, but I think comes strictly from Chin Yong's writings. What? Don't know me? It's me, I'm your beggar friend. Don't recognize me? You? <laughs> I'm a girl, so don't call me brother. Now you might be wondering why the film is called The Brave Archer when there's no archery in it. Part of that is that um, the original story, and, and you see this much more in the 1958 film, saw the hero going to Mongolia for, for his training with the seven eccentrics. And of course, what, what were the Mongols big into? Horse riding, wrestling, archery. And, and that's where the title comes from, the eagle shooting heroes, because the idea is that the central character Cow becomes so good at archery that he shoots two eagles with one shot. But Chang Che clearly I didn't have the budget or the inclination to stage any scenes like that, so there's no archery at all in The Brave Archer. It's just the title that remains from that side of the story. <laughs> 